Good morning. We didn't think that we'd be back to just virtual again, but uh, here we are, and uh, we're just glad that you can join us this morning as we are together. Uh, you know, as God's family comes together, whether we're here in person or whether we're gathered this way, He still blesses us. His presence is still with us. And this morning, I want us to think for a few moments along the concept, have faith in God. You've just been listening to uh, Marlene play that hymn. Uh, it was written by B.B. McKinney, who was one of our uh, Southern Baptist songwriters. He was a prolific writer, writing uh, well over a hundred hymns uh, when uh, that he wrote and composed. He took the message out of Mark 11th chapter and uh, of where Jesus deals with the fig tree. And in it, he wrote this hymn, Have Faith in God. He wanted to remind us that God can do anything through us if we will believe in him, if we will walk with him. Mark 11, uh, getting about verse 12 and then down to verse 22. An unusual story. It's a story of Jesus and the fig tree, one that's always been of great interest to me. It says on oh, verse 12, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree far off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs had not yet come. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And then there's an interlude as he there uh, somewhere else in, in another ministry. And then back in 22, they come back again and they see the fig tree. And verse 21 says, And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered, saying unto him, Have faith in God. What a powerful message is given to us here as we look at it and we think about it. Jesus and his disciples were traveling. They were going along, and they saw the fig tree. And he was looking at it, and he wanted to uh, have some figs. I learned and understood this uh, story quite a bit more when I had, was able to spend some time in Gaza in the compound where we were staying. There was a large fig tree. And every morning when the guys that were hauling us around would come by, the first place they went was to this fig tree. Uh, the figs there uh, that they're growing are large and they they eat them when they still look green to me. But uh, they take them and peel them, and uh, they are always looking for them. And they, every morning, they get every one of them that was where they could eat them off of the tree. A little later, as was visiting with the family, as we were uh, sharing with them, uh, they're very concerned about uh, greeting you and uh, doing something special for you. And that day, as we visited with the family, the lady brought out one of these figs, peeled, and gave it to us and to, to eat. It was the, their way of great, giving greetings. So the fig tree was very important to them. It was a place of food. It was a place of them showing that they cared for others. And Jesus was using that fig tree that day as he saw it when it did not bear the fruit for them to have anything to eat. When it was not really reaching out, he said, it serves no purpose. It serves no purpose. And soon it had withered away because of the words that Jesus spoke to it. He was reminding us that God works through us. God can do things through us, but only if we're open to him. About three things I want us to think about this morning that comes from the message here. The first is that God is our hope. And as you look at that hymn sometimes, Have Faith in God, one of the lines says an important message, never alone are the least of God's children. 
of his children. It's saying our Father cares for our needs. He knows those needs and he wants to take care of them. He knows how to use us and what he wants us to do. Henry, my grandson and I, we love to go shopping together. That's one of our favorite things to do. We go into the store and I'll say, Henry, now you pick out something that you want and he'll go and he'll look carefully and he'll pick out his one thing and then we go up and I pay for it. That's, that's the way that we, it works. He picks it, I pay for it. Is that not what God does for us? He sends us out and he says, go make a difference. Go make a difference. And if we do as he says, if we try to walk as he says, he blesses us in that. He walks with us. For our hope is in following his word. Our hope is doing what he asks us to do and asks us how we live. Do we understand truly what he's saying to us? That if we're out working for him and doing what he asks to, we're never alone. He opens doors. He opens doors that sometimes seems totally impossible for us to do. Some years ago, I had sent a couple of medical teams into Indonesia. It was after the tsunami had hit and uh, so many people had uh, died along their coastline and so many had been injured. It was a section of Indonesia that had been closed for uh, many, many years to any Christian witness. But we had just a time frame there in which we could get in. And so we sent these teams in, not knowing exactly how they would be accepted or what would be able to do through them. As they got there, uh, they went and they talked to the imam who they sent them to, who is the more or less controller of the mosque and of, the, of their Muslim religion there. They talked with him and shared it. He said, we desperately need the medical help. He said, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And he came back a short time later and he said, this is what I've worked out. I will do the call, their call that they do to worship, uh, the early one. And said, after that, you can have the mosque for the rest of the day. You can come and you can use it as a hospital and take care of the people. And so this medical team, as they were there, not only did they get to take care of the medical needs, but they got to share with them about Jesus inside the mosque there, telling what his love and what he could do for them. A door that was open that seemed impossible, but God was there. Because they were working for him. They were serving him. He opened the doors for him. He is our hope in whatever we do, however we go. Second thing he reminds us of, he can meet our every need. Whatever's there, he can take care of it. You know, last week we talked for a moment about Jesus' first miracle. About when he went and he turned the water into wine. Mary had come to him and told him that there was a need. They had run out of the wine for him. And so he at first said, I, it's in my time's not here. I don't want to do this. But then he went ahead. For Jesus had a plan. He responded because he wanted us to understand. He cares for our every need. Even the little things that don't seem important there if it's something that can make a difference in our lives, he will take care of it. He walks with us fully in all the things we do. Luke probably explains it best as he comes back. And he shares in his scripture in the 12th chapter. He talks about two or three different things about how God reaches out, out to us and what he does. And he uses the things around us to give us that example. Over in, in the 12th chapter and the 6th verse, he makes the statement, he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? What he's saying is, if you go to the marketplace, and one of the foods for the poorer 
were the sparrows. He said you can buy five of these, which the two furthings would be about half a cent. You can buy about five of these. They don't cost much, but even if they seem of little worth to people, God looks after them. God takes care of them. But he continues as he talks. He says in verse 24, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? He's saying, if God can take care of the ravens, if he deals with them, the crows, if he's willing to take care of them and he understands them that much, don't you think he'll take better care of you? Don't you think that he will meet your needs when you have them? And then in verse 27, he goes on to say, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow cast into the oven, how much more would he clothe you? O ye of little faith, he's saying, God will meet your needs. Do you really understand how much he cares for you, how much he loves you and what he does? As he does that, he reminds us of something. He reminds us that God cares for us. He cares for the people around us. They, whether well, every country they're in, he's reaching out to them to make a difference. Do we have the faith to reach them? Do we have the faith? Will we take a chance on touching the world about us to make that difference? Some years ago, I had a chance to be in Gaza. An interesting place to be. We were there and we were working with the children. Uh, in the morning times, we were doing something like a uh, vacation Bible school that, to be with them. That we were teaching them actual English, but teaching them about the love of God. And in the afternoon, we'd be uh, sharing food with the people there. It said there was great need for uh, food because the people were hungry. But one day as I was going back and forth between the checkpoint, it was the Jewish military checkpoint, and I got to know some of the uh, military folks there. I was talking to a young lady that checked me through several times, and she asked me, she said, what exactly are you all doing? And I told her that we were working with the children. We were trying to help them uh, with English and just trying to help them realize that people cared about them. And this young lady in the Israeli military said, I would give anything to go with you, to work with the children, to make a difference in their lives. Can we learn and understand how much that, care, or that caring God puts into us? He wants us to do that. In uh, Romans seventeen seven, Paul reminds us, he says, Respect and love your fellow men, your fellow believers. Understand them. Care about them. I spent uh, a lot of years uh, in ministry in different areas. And uh, after I had moved back to Mississippi, I uh, felt like that God wanted me to do something in missions and something special. And I had made up my mind exactly what I thought that he wanted me to do. I thought I wanted to go to Kentucky and work with the, uh, the mountain people in, in uh, eastern Kentucky, and especially with the young people there. I had read about a ministry there, and I knew the lady was retiring. I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. But you know what? God didn't have that plan. He said, have you ever considered the needs in your own state, in Mississippi? if you consider the needs of the young people, of the children there. And so for 32 years, I was given the opportunity to work with them, to touch lives. These young people that were so much in need, to see them, so many of them follow Christ and to reach out. Do we care about our people? Do we look and see 
Where does God want us to be? It may not be where we think we want to be, but it may be important than any other place we can. Third thing I would ask you, can you believe God's grace and love for us? Ephesians 3, 17 through 21. Once again, Paul is writing to share with us his thoughts of what he understands God is telling us. In uh, verse 17 beginning, it says, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. He's saying to us, do you really understand how great is the love that God has for us? The height, depth, width, length, it moves through all areas. Can we understand how far-reaching it is and what happens when I had a chance to be in Russia right after it had opened up, one of the things that I noticed quickly was how dear the Russian Christians were. Some of the nicest, kindest people I've ever had any dealing with. So full of love for us as fellow Christians, but most of all, so full of love and caring for the lost of the, their nation. So many so many never hear him. It was interesting to talk to some of the young people. They'd grown up in communism. They didn't know anything about Jesus. And they wanted to hear. They wanted to know what difference was there. One afternoon I had a chance to visit. It was a, their holiday of their victory over Germany. I got to visit with many of the uh, generals and admirals of that period of time. They were being honored in because I was an American, they allowed me to go through and talk to them. And I will never forget one as he shared his feelings. He said, we once were enemies, now we're friends. Can we be friends forever? That was a feeling at that time. What an opportunity we missed in Russia to really make a difference for Jesus. You know, it's interesting to me as I uh, read the scripture and look at it. The Jews, as they were dealing with Jesus, they worked like crazy to keep the law. I think it was just imperative that they, every detail of it they wanted to do, down to the how many steps you could take on their Sabbath day. They knew how to do the legalism but they could never understand the faith that it took to believe in Jesus. I sometimes wonder, are we getting to that point in our nation that we're so caught up in the legalism and all the things about us and how we're going to make a difference that we forget that only God can make a difference. That's what he's saying to us. Do you understand my love and grace? Can you work to give it, again, or give it away? You know, we understand works. We understand that if we can do this and make a difference, it's important. But can we ever understand free grace? Free grace, we only get it by being willing to accept it. There's nothing we can do. It's so contrary to anything we think of that even the world doesn't understand. It. But what it's a reminder of, through faith, we can have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Through faith, He lives within us. Through faith, we can face eternity in our walk with Him. Have you, through faith, opened your heart? You may not have ever believed. If you've not, I'd ask you this morning, take time to pray and ask Jesus to come into your life. But at these of us that are believers, do we stop and think what we have? What faith allows us to do in changing the world in which I, we live. I pray this week you'll look about you and figure out your way to make a difference by sharing Jesus 
with those you come in contact with. Thank you for being with us today. Would you join me now as we close in prayer? Father, how thankful we are that we have the promise that if we have faith in you, we can make a difference in our world. If we have faith in you, that you walk with us. If we have faith in you, we begin to see how broad, how wide, how deep is the love that you pour out upon us. Father, as we take that love, I pray that we will take it and use it by giving it away to others to help them understand what God can do within their lives, the difference that Jesus makes to us every day. Father, bless each one that uh, is listening, each one around us, and help us that we will be the ones that will change our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.